Today I want to go over enthalpy variation with temperature where there's no phase transition. Enthalpy varies with temperature and we're going to see how it's calculated given one temperature and asked to find the enthalpy at some other temperature. Let's start kind of slow. Heat capacity, Cp, is defined as a ratio of the heat added to a substance over the resulting change in temperature. But more often it's written as an equation like I've shown here defining heat. In this equation, heat delta Q, the change in heat, is N Cp dt. N can represent mass and then Q is an extensive quantity, specific heat, or N could represent moles more often, and then Q is a, an intensive quantity, molar heat, or joules per mole. I've written Cp to suggest that we're using a heat capacity at constant pressure. At constant pressure, delta H is equal to Q, and thus we have this equation. Clearly, the equation tells us how much delta H changes. So if we know delta H1 and heat capacity Cp at some temperature, and we want to know delta H2 at some nearby temperature, then it can be calculated by delta H2 equals delta H1 plus N Cp delta T. If we're using molar quantities, as in one mole, then N equals 1, and it doesn't get written in the equation. For close temperatures, Cp is treated as a constant. Most often, the delta H1 that we're actually able to find is delta H of formation at 298.15 K, such as the case for water steam shown in this figure. We see data graphed for delta H of formation for steam from 500 degrees C to 6000 degrees C. The graph is not linear, but this equation right here suggests that it should be. That can only mean that Cp is not constant with temperature. For many substances, we can find tables for the variation of Cp with temperature. Indeed, for many substances, we can find tables for the variation of delta H with temperature, but certainly not all. Take, for example, ethanol. The heat capacity varies from 37.12 at 50K to 189 at 3000K, and it isn't even linear. The usual sources for delta H data have only delta H of formation at 298 listed and do contain tables of heat capacity versus temperature. Fortunately, there is a way to calculate delta H at some second temperature by using the tabulated Cp values. We can do an example with steam, and since we have delta H values for steam already graphed, we can look and see how much error there might be in the method. Our example reads, find the variation of delta H as a function of temperature for water between 500K and 6000K. For reference, delta H of 298 is minus 241.8 kilojoules per mole. I repeat the guidance equation right here, and then note that for our delta H of 1, we'll be using the delta H of formation at 298 degrees. Since Cp is a function of temperature, we're going to need to integrate it in order to find delta H at all of the possible temperatures. If we knew the function of temperature that describes Cp, then we could integrate the equation and use it to compute delta H at any temperature, thus finding delta H2 at all of the temperatures. We need enough Cp values for steam at different temperatures to get a pretty good idea of the shape of the curve. Then we can fit the curve to a polynomial and integrate the polynomial. Okay, from the NIST web book, I was able to find the following values for temperature versus heat capacity. By graphing these values in a spreadsheet program such as Excel or GeoGebra, 
we can easily fit the data to an order three polynomial, which is easy enough to integrate. Here we have the data graphed and fit to the polynomial. The red curve is this function that you see at the top right here. So f of x is some constant a times the temperature cubed plus some constant b times the temperature squared plus c times t plus d. And you can see that it isn't a wonderful fit, but it's good enough for the purposes we're going to use it for. So we have the constants a, b, c, and d. And this was quite easy. It took as long as it took to type the data in, and that was all. So the next step is to actually integrate this function that we have found in order to get a value for delta h so, such that we can use it. So now I show the integral as a function of temperature, delta h as a function of temperature. And <clears throat> you can either integrate this yourself in order to get, in order to get what I show here. Or you could go to Wolfram Alpha, and they would probably integrate it for you online. Anyway, now we can write the function for calculating delta H of 2. You can see that this is, once again, our guidance equation. We had a value for delta H of formation at 298. And now we have a, func a function, delta H of T, given right here, that will calculate what this delta H will be for any particular t, or for that matter, for all of them. A very important note is that this delta H of formation of 298 was given in kilojoules per mole, but Cp that we tabulated was given in joules per mole k. Consequently, this function, delta H of t, will yield values in joules per mole. Now, in order to add kil of uh, kilojoules to joules per mole, one of them needs to be converted. Here we show the original data with the new function delta H2 right here plotted on top of it in red. You can see that we were quite successful in finding a function that would predict the delta H values for steam. And I can assure you it works quite well for other substances, such as ethanol or whatever substance you might be able to find CP values for. I hope you found this video instructive, and keep coming back for more. Thank you.